So you're, you're setting up your new company today means that you need uh, more than ever to, to start with a team that will have a long, it's got experience in growth and, uh, and corporate governance, which means people working together and finding ways to, to solve problems together. Welcome to A State of Readiness, a podcast set as a fireside chat with business leaders to discuss what it takes for a company to be in a state of readiness and become a higher performance organization with your host, Joseph Paris. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of State of Readiness. I'm your host, Joseph Paris. My guest today is Bill Beers, international business and technology attorney and author of the book, Smarter Business Exits, published in 2020. Williams Business Advisories assist companies, their owners, boards, and investors throughout a company's business life cycles, re-advises on such matters as organizational design, business formation, capital raising, equity compensation, governance, risk management, crisis resolution, resiliency planning, compliance, roll-ups, corporate sales, and divestitures. And with his technical advisor, he assists domestic and foreign clients on digital transformation, e-commerce, privacy, cybersecurity, and strategic transactions. Fluent in French, William has an undergraduate diploma from Yale and law degrees from New York University and the University of Grenoble in France. Welcome, Bill. How are you doing today? Hey, great to see you, Joe. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's great to have you on the uh, on the show today. Um, you know, we... We've uh, run across one another quite a bit over at uh, David uh, Deutsch's Saratoga weekend over the years. Oh, you still have your cowboy hat, no? I, I do. It's uh, behind me here, but you know, when I when I wear it on the podcast, uh, you know, the top of it goes over the the top of the frame, so I usually don't wear it on here. But um, listen, uh, you gave me a book, um, your Smarter Business Exits uh, book, and I got to tell you. Uh, I've read it cover to cover at least twice, um, and I've read sections of it uh, over and again. And I found it fascinating on many levels. Um, first, you know, I've been in business uh, you know for thirty years, and a lot of my clients were family-owned businesses, especially early on. And every challenge that you shared uh, in here in your book, I have seen, I've I've observed. Can't say I've experienced it because you know I've always been a, a single shareholder of the companies, but um, you know the, the succession planning, the uh, the the family challenges, uh, you know who gets it, the kid, or are you going to you know uh, you know let it go to an acquirer? I mean, there's a lot of wisdom in this book, and um, you know what do you think some of the real challenges, the pervasive challenges? are when somebody's setting up a business and through the business life cycle? Well, I've had uh, the, the biggest problem is uh, designing an exit plan from the beginning. It's very simple. And a well done plan is something that you can both agree upon before you go in, at the time you go in. And if you don't do the exit plan at the time you go in, you're gonna have conflict. And the conflict is not going to always resolve amicably. So uh, it's really simple. Uh, you set up a, a governance. Who's going to who's going to be able? How you decide things? What the purpose is? What your collaboration is all about? Uh, and and what happens if you don't agree on stuff, uh, including uh, a buyback by the company or buyback by the majority shareholder or some way of a joint exit? Uh, something that will allow the people to to re retain the value that they've worked on together. And what I see is it's a, it's, a, it's a, the beginning is only part of the journey, and it, the exit planning is a marathon that starts at the beginning. And if you don't start it right, you may never get it right, and you may have someone get expelled at the beginning, which is just a catastrophe. So uh, wasted effort and. Uh, Plan, 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 and be ready. So it's simple. Yeah. So, so you know, when <clears throat> I'm going to share with you, this is I'm going to take you into Dr. Whoopi's Wayback Machine. You know, the date is August 1985, and the uh, a new company called Zonatech is being formed. And at the time, I had two other partners. Now, when I say we started our little consultancy on a shoestring, I mean 
probably we didn't have enough money for a shoestring. So we're sitting around our uh, launch table. We're having dinner at a Chinese restaurant at our launch table. And um, one of the partners asks what his weekly salary is going to be. All right. Now, after the formation costs, getting a phone line, getting some stationery and that dinner, we had about three hundred dollars left. And I look at him, I said, listen, how we have three hundred dollars left. How much do you want it to be? All right. So I, I think that, you know, when people are getting into business for the first time, what they don't know is a lot. And what they don't know can hurt them a great deal. So how do how does a person starting a business know what they don't know? Well, you have to ask. You have to really start with a team, and the team has got a, a knowledge bank uh, that's outside the scope of, of uh, pure and entrepreneurship. Uh, the team is going to be uh, lawyers, accountants, uh, hopefully at some point uh, investment advisors, uh, and um, People, uh, technicians, maybe if, if you're, if you're, although you're, you may hire them, and basically what you're looking for is you're looking some, for someone to challenge you, to ask you questions that start you thinking about what is what is my agenda and how do I know that I'm covered and I've got this done right, uh, and uh, I've seen I've got uh, everybody has seen situations where you don't get it right the first time and you don't think about it. It's real simple. Don't procrastinate, ask questions, ask people outside of, of your, your skill set, because that's the only way you learn. It's like going to university. But yeah, unfortunately, it's that, that's part of consulting. You gotta find out and ask questions. And then the consultant's gonna say, what is the problem you're concerned about? And the issue is, how do I maintain gut corporate governance all the way through, through a joint exit where we all make a lot of money? And that's the start, starting question. Yeah, so you, know, you mentioned um, you know governance. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there, um, especially <laughs> with COVID, that are just now starting their business. Okay, they came from industry. Uh, I started mine right out of university, so you know they're starting uh, probably uh, their business somewhere later in their career. Uh, you mentioned all these consultants and all these advisors, which you know in retrospect, you know looking. Be back, uh, maybe that could have been helpful uh, to me earlier. Um, but when you're starting, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, you, you don't know that you need, uh, you might have a notion that you need an accountant, you might have a notion that you need an attorney. You know, my, my attorney, when I was uh, starting, you know, came up with an articles of organization. Okay. But when we're reading it, there are words on a page. You know, we're not, I wasn't a business person at the time. And well, how I, do we know what's, what words should be on that page? And actually, what they all that's, mean? A very, that's a very good question, Joe, because my experience recently is that uh, uh, people are, are using online tools to sign up things and they have no clue what they mean. And uh, I've had occasions, I won't mention the uh, uh, legal online uh, uh, companies, but uh, I've had to correct things and uh, things have been not signed. People don't sign things. They don't understand them. Uh, and they, they need to really have a buddy who is a coach and friend and collaborator, uh, mediator of disputes between, between shareholders, perhaps taking a neutral position in favor of, of everybody growing uh, the company and surviving, getting all the funding they need and, and building value with the value supply chain of, of suppliers and customers. And right. so the, the, the getting started point is it takes a lot of time. Um, I can tell you a little story about Delaware. I recently had to get a document out of the Delaware Secretary of State. And they, they, uh, they said it's going to be 10 weeks, 12 weeks to get. And I said, well, why does it take so long? So, well, we're inundated with new companies being formed during COVID. And, um, uh, if you want to do it 24 hours, we'll give it to you in 72 and you have to pay extra. So it's like they're swamped and they have thousands of things that they need to do. So you're, you're setting up your new company today means that you need 
uh, more than ever to, to start with a team that will have a long, it's got experience in growth and, uh, and corporate governance, which means people working together and finding ways to, to solve problems together. And that the, the, the setup should mean something I'll know how we vote. I know what we agree on. I know what, how we, what if I lose, if, if I want something and I don't have the power to do so because I don't have enough votes. Okay, that's what I have to do. I have to, to, to negotiate and persuade. So um, how, you know, and I'm again, you know, I'm, I'm the entrepreneur. How do I know a good advisor from a bad advisor? Well, um, you can use all the online uh, uh, tools, but that's that's pe people start online. You ask people you know um, uh, for information. You can search, um, and it's very. You can search for authors. You can search for topics, um, and uh, I think it's a question of you ask for about experience. What experience do you have with startups? What with growth? With international expansion? With shareholder disputes, with um, alignment, uh, with, with funding of uh, venture capital, private equity, uh, with uh, joint ventures, uh, um, mergers and acquisitions, sale to a, a, a strategic alliance partner, management buyouts, um, employee stock ownership plans. Basically, you have to ask a lot, and these are topics about. Uh, building and exiting, and I, uh, I offered this book because I've been so through through so many distress situations that I got upset about it. I said this is emotionally disturbing to me as an attorney. Everybody's do, get, making mistakes, so my job was to characterize and I, identify and, and and characterize the mistakes. And I said, well, this is a, these are mistakes that are being done all at the beginning. And along the marathon of the journey to where eventually, uh, whether it's 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there's got to be an exit. And so I'm looking at the traje trajectory of the exit. And I think you have to ask for an advisor who's got full broad skills or a team of, with full broad skills that will take you through each step because there are lots of steps. Right. Okay. So we get our business off the launch pad and we've got all these documents governing supposedly uh, the way we're going to operate. But, you know, life is funny, right? There's the uh, unknown unknowns as Donald Rumsfeld uh, famously shared. And we're going to have to change our organization the way we do business over time. It's inevitable. Um, you know, how do we, uh, how does that how would you recommend that occur with the least amount of friction and animosity? You know, I'm thinking about, you know, taking on another investor or another partner, for instance, or one of the investors or partners wanting to leave or leaving. Um, you know, what are some of the dynamics that people have to be aware of in uh, those situations? Keeping in mind that uh, for you in the audience, that um, you know, this is a discussion. This is not giving you any advice whatsoever. So um, don't hold <laughs> us accountable. All right, I mean, we're just having some casual conversations here. So if you say, "Geez, uh, Joe and Bill said this," well, yeah, we might have said it, but we didn't mean it. Um, so uh, the caveat emptor, right? I guess is a uh, yes. Thank you, Joe. It's it's real simple. Uh, Every uh, bit of advice depends upon the actual circumstances. We're not asking anybody for their actual circumstances. So this is basically general information. Right. And, uh, you know, you do need to consult with experts. But right. um, the question is really how to plan. And, and uh, I think the, the most important thing is getting started. And uh, you need to set yourself some deadlines and, and uh, apply some discipline so that you get a feeling of, com of communication and joint decision making. Um, my experience is that uh, uh, you just cannot have a majority shareholder coming into the minority and saying, I want this and this is the way it's going to be. Because once you start doing that, then you have the, the majority, even though he's got, he or she's got the majority, becomes vulnerability, vulnerable. They, 
uh, control creates a vulnerability under, under corporate law because you have, you're subject to a fiduciary duty and you can't be self-serving. You can't manipulate an oppressed minority. And when I was in law school, we had a book called Oppression of Minority Shareholders. There was three volumes on all these case, case law. And so the, the majority owes a duty to the minority. And just as and reciprocally, the minority owns, owes the same duty. So that's what keeps, the, that's the glue that keeps them together. And, and corporate governance is determined if, you, if you're in a fight and you have to go to court about who was right, the court will decide, well, who exercised their fiduciary duty, who was, was, showed prudence and judgment. And that's what the board of directors uh, is held to and the shareholders as well for not abusing their privileges. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the legalese. So, you know, <clears throat> when it's coming time uh, for an exit strategy, you know, um, there's a lot of, you know, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? And we've started our business and, and we've had our, our challenges over the course of time. But now it's time to uh, pass the baton on to somebody else. And, you know, there's a lot of personalities involved. There's a lot of psychology involved. Um, you know, it is, uh, you know, I just... I just saw um, a golf match over the weekend. It was a very fascinating golf match. Uh, it was like a father and son, or uh, you know, pro and their uh, and their offspring kind of uh, uh, match. And John Daly and John Daly Jr. Uh, won it. And you know, Tiger was on there with uh, Tiger Jr. and um, and passing the baton onto a junior. Um, may or may not be in the best interest of the company, but there's a lot of dynamics. And especially if there's more than one junior involved, right? I mean, you have now siblings and some siblings might not want to be involved in the business and some do want to be involved in the business. And, you know, what are some of the dynamics that are going to occur there? Well, well, some of the, let me give you an example of a case where I had one son who wanted to be in the business and another son who was an artist and musician and didn't want to be in the business. And uh, this was uh, and the, the father who was the founder wanted to retire. And he was training the junior uh, who was interested to, to make decisions and observe and learn and communicate with everybody, be involved. So there's the, the selection of the possible successor. There's the training of the possible successor. There's the evaluation of the possible successor. And then there's the, 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 the appointment but it has to be the appointment of the family success of the family successor has to follow some kind of family constitutional rules to maintain harmony within the family. And so what the, the, the structure of this deal was that the father decided to, to allocate, uh, he, he did some family giving and the family giving was he gave some uh, a fancy house, uh, a vacation house to the artist's son. And he gave the company with subject to certain, you know, he gave shares in the company, but not controlling shares every, uh, and to the, to the operating son. And um, <clears throat> that sort of left. And so there's a valuation question that creates family harmony at the beginning. So you maintain the family harmony and the family respect while, while freeing. And so then there's no guilt and there's no family uh, hostility um, between the siblings. Well, so you that, hope that's, that's the case, right? But that's only if, <laughs> if uh, reasonable minds are at the table. I mean, uh, uh, you know, right. if if the person that wanted, if the son that wanted to take the the company forward, and the artist son, um, you know, if if they were not playing nice in the sandbox, that could have got ugly real quick. Well, yeah, and actually, if you're looking at this from an international standpoint and from community property standpoint. <clears throat> Uh, there are succession plans that you can't do uh, uh, because people have forced airship. They, they, the, the law of, of probate or the, the law of uh, succession says that you have to give a certain amount to your spouse. Um, even New York has, has such a provision, but it's pretty weak. So um, uh, it's, it, there's a whole artistry of family succession. <laughs> And hopefully that might have been discussed up front 
in the formation of the company. But at that time, the, the, the founder might not have been married or had sons. No, no, it was definitely not discussed up front. But the yeah. sunny boy who was, it became the manager had to fix a, a failed acquisition that the daddy had done, uh, where basically all the talent left. And he had to reconstruct yeah. and he, re, he had to redirect. So that was trial by fire. Indeed, indeed. So, um, what are some of the other things that that people have to um, you know be aware of? I mean, I, I, I get obviously you're emphasizing get your ducks in a row when you start, okay? But I'm thinking about you know the average person starting a business, especially for the first timers, they might not have a whole lot of resources to spend on accountants and attorneys especially if they have intellectual property, which obviously is a whole different animal, right? I mean, if they have intellectual property, they have to you know, protect it by copyright or uh, patents or what, what have you, uh, trademarks and what have you. Um, you know, how do these people uh, that, that they might have a finite number of resources, but they seem to, to feel that they have an infinite demand on those resources. What kind of guidance do you give them? Well, actually, uh, <clears throat> I think you have to look at the whole thing as uh, a, a, a unity, a German is gestalt, uh, and, and see that you're going c- covering uh, that your bases because everybody's got a different hat. And if you have to identify that your partner may also be, your co-owner might be an employee. And you have to be, and so that makes you vulnerable to employment law rules uh, where you might be abusing the majority or the CEO might be abusing the employment rules. And so the, the solution to that is to, to take a look at all of the things you need to do, get a plan. And actually, you know, there, there are people who help you plan at the beginning and say, we need intellectual property, we need um, uh, in, insurance, we need accounting. We need employment law, we need stock option plans, and we need to understand that we can, uh, the vesting schedules in the stock option plans are critical to the control and getting value. So you may have a deferred vesting of a year and then small vesting of the balance of the shares over three more years until, until you really get the company rolling. So you, you gotta manage expectations. And during those times when you're having the vesting period, deferred vesting, you want it to, to, to get value from the employee. So you need to discipline yourself on talent management, talent and value creation. In fact, what's most important is at the end, what you want is you want a talent pool of people who are thrilled to work for the company, uh, who are gonna be happy to work for the new owner. So you have knowledge management and you have uh, transition management, all, all the things that are essential to, to keeping uh, your a, a talented pool working independently towards the common goal. Right. So that's your, your the founder's job is to ultimately uh, become unnecessary. But you don't want to do that un- unless you've got that through a plan. And I spoke with someone uh, uh, who's going to be in a management buyout. I uh, said, well, the owner is going to be doing a management buyout of t- two or three years. And so right now I want to build up my aspect of how I can participate in that best. So right. not only is the, the, the founder um, or controlling founder planning, it's everybody else planning and they're working together to, to a joint exit where, where the founder's gone, but the, the, the others have a definite role. So it, it's defining the roles. And then the worst thing you want to, th- that's going to happen is <clears throat> somebody leaves because there's a fight. So then you lose a client relationships, you use knowledge, man- lose your, your knowledge uh, of, of process. And maybe you, so no one else in, in the company can do that, that person's process. So to safeguard that, you do the business continuity planning. And I, I, I learned all about this when I was doing outsourcing to offshore uh, in, uh, 20 years ago. And, and that means you basically, if, if, you're, if your service provider is, is providing you with something which is like software, you need to have access to the software in case they stop performing. So you do a software escrow. <clears throat> you want the right to step in and do the job 
if the, if they stop performing. So that's you, then you have uh, other people in the company who will have ancillary notes who can fill in, and that's sort of like filling in the holes. So you want to have a web of knowledge that will be uh, flexible and resilient. So it gets to the resiliency issue, okay? And and then then all of that <clears throat> needs to be built upon with continuous process improvement, so that everybody gets an improved process as, as you improve your platform, as you improve your sales and, you, and your marketing and your R&D and your products so that you can then um, have the team go forward and say, we, 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 have you heard about Cape Carnegie Mellon capability maturity model, which basically means step one is you know how to do the deal. Step five is you're continuously improving. And, and in, in, in between, you, step two is you can repeat the deal because you figured it out. So uh, the continuous process improvement is something that the team needs to do. And that's your human capital uh, and your, your team management. And, and it, not only with internally, but for your supply chain. And that's where the outsourcing and insourcing are become interdependent. Very interesting. Right, right. So <laughs> a couple of things I, I want to touch on there that you've, you've sort of, uh, you know, uh, made me think about. Um, one is about the shares and options. And, you know, there's a saying, you know, of course, you're the lawyer, I'm not, that uh, possession is nine tenths of the law. Um, <laughs> and, and when I think about giving shares, when a person actually takes physical control of those shares, getting them back um, could take on a life of its own. You know, uh, even my experience has been, even if you spent a whole lot of money on, you know, uh, agreements to govern this uh, tra supposed transaction in the future, um, the same attorneys are going to argue over what those words really mean in court. So as long as a person's got the shares, it's very, very, you know, it, it could be very difficult to extract them. So what are your thoughts on like synthetic equity or, or phantom shares? First, uh, on, on the, the uh, I, I got, I'll get to the phantom shares because I've done mm -hmm. them and I'll explain what they are. But uh, the first is if you've got vested shares and a shareholder and, and uh, the employee then leaves the company. You have failed in your exit planning if you do not have in, in either in the stock purchase or stock option grant uh, or um, shareholders agreement that they're supposed to sign uh, a, a right of the company or majority, depending, uh, to buy back. Then the issue is what's fair. So uh, it's not going to be at bar value. It's going to be at fair market value. And then the issue is, does your agreement specify how you're the fair market value is going to be determined so that the person who is exiting feels it is not unfair. And, right. and uh, because there, if uh, in a squeeze out merger where a uh, majority just says, okay, I'm forming a new company, merging all the things. And anybody who has less than 51, less than 49% or less than 50% gets no shares and they get paid X. They can go to court in Delaware and have the judge say, no, X is too small. You need to get X plus Y. So that's a valuation uh, in, in a squeeze out merger. <clears throat> so the, the simple solution is to have an agreement with, with either valuation method or valuation by a third party neutral and it's done. Now, let me get to, <clears throat> that's for the real shares. And the phantom, phantom equity <clears throat> is <clears throat> something which is not equity at all. Right. It is a debt of the corporation uh, to pay uh, the holder of the quote phantom shares, the um, fair market value of those phantom shares as if they had been issued and therefore were counted in the capitalization table. So if you have 100 shares issued to everybody and then uh, there's five phantom shares issued to someone, then upon sale, the purchase price is allocated uh, according to 105 shares, deemed shares. And, and so that dilutes the holders of the 100 actual shares. But they have no, the nice part about phantom shares from the standpoint of corporate governance is nobody who has phantom shares can argue uh, against uh, fiduciary duty or oppression of, of, of minority shareholders because they own, don't own anything. It's just a debt. And, and the second thing is that, that if they screw up and they, they do something to, to negate the value of the company, 
they lose value too. So it's the equivalent of, of equity compensation for incentive purposes, but not for corporate governance purposes, which is very nice. Right, right, right. And, and so then, then if you really want to be cute about it, then uh, <clears throat> most uh, phantom share deals don't talk about the money that the majority owner or the founder will get from consulting fees post-sale for transition uh, to the new owner. And so in a sense, that's, that's, they have to, a phantom stockholder has to say, has to sell his or her services to the buyer so that they get some kind of additional consulting fee or, or maybe not because they've, they've just gotten enough out of the, the sale. Right, right. And that's that discretionary. Answer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I want to share with you, a, um, a company was expanding from the United States into Germany. And I was helping them land here. And they had to form, of course, a company, right? A GmbH. And um, we're you know, working with the attorneys and the articles of incorporation or whatever they're called in German um, were going to be in German and in English. But the, the, the document itself was going to be governed under the English script, not the German. The German is there for convenience only. So far, so good. So we're sitting in uh, the meeting with the you know two shareholders that are going to form this company, and the attorney proceeds to read the English um, out loud. You know, there's you know, maybe twenty pages or so of this English script, and the you know, I, I inquire, you know, why why is that required? I mean, you know, we, we all speak English here. Um, what's the problem? Why do we have to do this? And he says that he's required by law. To read this out loud okay so I, we, we humor him uh, and he reads it out loud uh and there's like three or four changes this whole the reading takes about 45 minutes and there's three or four changes that have to occur and so um he makes the changes and presents the new documents for signature and i ask what i thought was a reasonable question aren't you going to have to read this again and he says no so here we are signing the document he didn't have to read, but we didn't sign the document he did have to read. And that struck me as odd. And then I asked him, I said, where did this, you know, where did this even come from? And it goes back into times, you know, in antiquity when people didn't know how to read. And the only people that knew how to read were the notaries and the, you know, the, the upper crust, the elite. Yeah. So this is where this tradition came from. And then fast forward that, you know, these folks wanted to, you know, open a bank account and they decided to open it up in Commerce Bank and Commerce Bank wanted all the shareholders to be present at the signing or the opening of this account, even though only one shareholder was going to have signatory authority. And so, you know, it was quite inconvenient for the other shareholder to, to, you know, from America to get all the way to Munich just to open up a bank account. And so I asked the banker what I thought was a reasonable question. Do you have accounts with like Mercedes or BMW or, or IBM? And of course they said, yes, you know, we do a lot of business with international publicly traded companies. I said, when they wanted to open up an account at your bank, did you ask for all their shareholders to be present? Well, of course not. I said, so what's the problem? And so they, they decided that they were going to change their their policy for this particular transaction. But I, I share this story with you, uh, Bill, because you know, the audience is largely American um, that I have, not completely, probably 20% are not American, but Americans expanding abroad have to be prepared for things that are completely foreign to them, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> this is because I, I went to a French law school before I went to an American law school. And I take uh, American companies offshore and work with foreign local attorneys. And in your situation, I would have asked the question, well, gee, you know, does the German law allow for a power of attorney from me to Joe Paris to be uh, attending the session with uh, the bank, Commerce Bank to open the account? And I'm sure it does. So I don't need to go. And so there, there wasn't any thinking. And part of my job 
as, as an, if I'm an international business lawyer taking somebody offshore, I need to say, look, you have this cultural gap. I will help you translate the cultural gap and maybe we can find some solutions around it. But foreigners coming here, they have the same problem. Yeah. Because they, they have a notarial system offshore and, and we have no clue what the hell that is. It's the <laughs> Secretary of State. Okay. And then, so, and they have forced airship. They, they have all sorts of rules that we don't know about. And we have the same. So to be, to, 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 if you're looking for an, uh, a, a good consultant or a good advisor, pick someone who has done international growth as well and has suffered through the, the, the change in culture. And, and my job as lawyer is not just to be an advisor on U.S. law. It's to, to be a cultural advisor to say, OK, you're going to go into a system that's different. And here's how it's different. So you should expect this following stuff and uh, y- you can you can identify things, but you, I'm not advising on what to do. So that's your team. And, and it's really important. You know, you, you sh- I, I'm shocked that this American guy ever went to Germany. Uh, he, it was it was a, a sad situation because it was expensive. It was a waste of time. It, it was it took away revenue, uh, distracting and just made him angry. So uh, if your shareholders ask these questions, why do I need to go? Is there an alternative? Just keep asking, you know, stop, yeah. stop, stop complaining. Just ask. We can, we can find a solution. There's got to be a solution. I, I would go even further. Don't ask, tell. In other words, <laughs> you know, in other words, what I've, my experience, and, you know, I've been in Germany here for a while now. My experience is that um, somebody will tell you that this is the way it is unless they're challenged. Yes. Okay. And when they're challenged, then, um, because hardly anybody ever ever challenges anything here, um, when they're challenged, they have to think of, uh, they have to go back to to the basics. You know, why does this exist in the first place? Why can't we do what Joe is suggesting as a matter, you know, as as an example? Um, And usually the challenge itself will precipitate some forward momentum to a more reasonable solution. God bless you. That's, you know, it's, it's a dialogue of learning. And uh, so if you're, you know, my, my view in, in growing a business is that you need to go international at some point soon enough. And you need to have uh, on your website, you need to have a foreign address or maybe two foreign addresses to show that you mean business and you have something which is repeatable, which is meets this, the capability maturity model, which is respected by uh, the large enterprises so that you can get into the right target of, of customers and clients. Uh, so just go in and to be international, you need to think differently and just accept that. And now Americans have a problem because they, they don't speak the foreign language. They've never been trained in the culture. I mean, I've got, I've, I've worked with, with clients from 20 different countries. I've had to learn uh, more than one language to get around. And uh, I've had to learn a little bit of culture. And I always want to say, how are you doing? Good morning in, in the foreign language. I got to be able to be culturally attuned. And that's part of the emotional intelligence of international business. If you, are, if you don't say bonjour to a French guy, he's going to say, excuse me. I've had people tell me, excuse me. And then I say, bonjour. And they say, okay, fine. <laughs> they're, they're happy to talk to me. So don't insult the foreigners. Listen, open, open yourself. Think about cultural gaps. Think about things that you can do where you're not imposing, uh, quote, an ugly American standard. You're, you're listening and you're inviting and you're, you're adapting. And that's where business grows. You know, um, and if you do it right, you could actually have a lot of fun. Right. I mean, you know, well, are you talking about the beer guard, the Munich, well, uh, beer well, you, know, it, stuff? you know, whether I'll tell you, you know, my modus operandi, uh, Bill, when I'm traveling the world is uh, I will eat what they eat. I will drink what they drink. I will try to, you know, um, uh, assimilate and enjoy or be empathetic, you know, enjoy their perspective, you know, uh, or their, their experience from their perspective. Um and a little bit of self-deprecating humor goes a long way. You know, when you 
when you make a, a mistake, which inevitably you will, uh, just make fun of yourself and everybody will enjoy it. Yeah, I, I have I, I have a couple. I've created my own jokes to, to deprecate uh, myself yeah. so that I, 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 I loosen up a little bit, make them laugh a little bit. I don't mind laughing at myself and it's just easier. And then they say, well, gee, Americans are not so bad. Right. Because okay? they, they might have an opinion already. <laughs> they, they almost always do. They almost always do. So, well, listen, Bill, do you have any uh, parting advice for our guests or our audience today? Well, um, the reason I wrote the book Smarter Business Exits is because I'd come across so many distressed people who had built a business and were finding themselves in, in trouble, not because they'd built the business, but because they couldn't run it right. And they hadn't planned to get out and they, 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 had, they took in some wrong people. They didn't plan that they could get rid of the, the wrong people and, uh, and that they can keep control. And, and even with a 50-50, which I'm not, I'm not keen on, you know, a 50-50, then you have to have it's veto power all the time. Like Joe Manchin coming in and saying, okay, I'm your partner. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so um, the parting way is that, that you need to uh, feel comfortable. Identify what you're missing. It's, it's identify the, the issue of control. Identify how, how you're going to lose control and yet retain it. And then you have to always work on collaboration, transparency, and, and feel good stuff because, uh, and, and that means in some kind of in, in comp equity compensation, maybe, and maybe it includes other things, uh, so that uh, you can exit as a team. The goal is to exit as a team, and, and there are different methods for getting out. Uh, you sell, sell to a, a, an acquirer, you do a management buyout, you can do an employee stock option plan, you can do maybe a spinoff if you want, where the 50-50 go two different ways and they each create separate companies. There are lots of ways to solve the problem. But if you procrastinate and you don't look at this issue from the beginning, you have a total blind spot and it's not going to be pretty. So get informed, stay informed, keep focusing. Set yourself a plan, a plan with deadlines and specific actions at least two, two years before you want to get out. And, and I would and assume you start, that you should start at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And you should probably revisit, make a purposely revisit it every once in a while. Gee, you know, uh, Joe, uh, we re revisit our wills, don't we? Maybe. But Maybe. we all procrastinate on that too. So hmm. this is nothing more than a succession plan for non family. Right. Exactly right. Well, listen, Bill, uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, and thanks for sharing all of, uh, of your wisdom. Um, I noticed that your book just came out. I mean, 20, uh, 2020, correct? Well, well, it came out just as COVID was being, uh, was, was shutting down offices. Yeah. So it wasn't a personal, a great time for, for promo, but it was a great time for people to think about this. So people are coming out with new businesses all the time and it's time to start right. Well, I like the words. I like your, your words. Get ready. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I uh, I've read, like I said, I've read it a couple of times. Um, it's a must have book for anybody that's starting uh, a business. Um, but it's never too late. If you've already started one and you don't know what you might have missed, um, you know, reading this book might actually make you a bit nervous. But it's better to face the peril on your own terms than to have the terms thrust upon you always. So again, Bill, thanks a lot for joining me. Um, I, anybody that wants this, you can get your this a copy uh, of this book on Amazon. Yes. Yes. Okay. So Amazon Smarter Business Exits. Very simple. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for listening to State of Readiness. You can discover more episodes and learn about the book written by Joseph Paris of the same title at www.state-of-readiness.com. You can learn more about Joseph Paris at www.josephparis.me/card.